Hello. Okay, hi guys, welcome to my mic talk presentation. Okay, so my mic talk is about an overview of magnetic resonance imaging, also known as an MRI. Now, here are the contents that we're going to go through. So we're going to go over what is an MRI, how the MRI machine works, how does that work again, and then the uses for an MRI and when do we use them in medicine. We're going to also go over why it's important to have an MRI available in a hospital. So yeah. So first of all, what is an MRI? Well, we talked about how what it means, so we can just go over what it does. So an MRI is a medical imaging technique that records changing magnetic fields. It's also called a nuclear magnetic resonance, capable of complete body scans, but commonly used for the brain, and can give different kinds of images based on the pulse sequence. We're going to go over what the pulse sequence is in the next slide. But here's an example of an image of the brain obtained by using an MRI. Obviously. The use of an MRI is because an X-ray can only give us so much. An MRI can give us the intricate details of the brain, give us the intricate details of the muscles. That's why we use an MRI in terms of sort of diagnosing people with what they need to be diagnosed with. Now, the MRI machine in itself. The main components of it is the radio frequency coil, the gradient coils, and the magnet. Um, those are what make the MRI the MRI. So, the main parts, as I mentioned, are the RF coils, the gradient coils, and the magnet that is used. And then the patient is required to lay as still as possible. This is due to the magnetic um, sort of resonance that it does. Um, there's a sequence of what it does to the magnetic field that sort of alters it to allow the whole picture to be taken from the person. And in terms of that, in, to allow that to happen, the person needs to be as still as possible. A machine can cost as much as $1 million. Um, there's also a certain amount of people that can't take it. You can't take an MRI if you have um, Sort of metals in your body that could be from like a filling that could be from like if you have like a metal stint in your brain you could have a metal stint in your arm if you've broken your arm you can't really take it you also can't take it if you're claustrophobic because it's a very tight enclosed space um also if you're pregnant you can't take it because of the magnetic radiation that's given also you can't take a um it's basically what you if you can't take an x-ray you can't really take an mri um that's like the main sort of people that kind of can't take an mri now, how does an MRI work? I talked about the magnetic sort of radiation that it takes. Um, a new thing is something called the Z panel. Now, the Z panel is mostly used for 3D sort of imaging. So you normally have your X and Y that go up and down. Your Z goes sort of straight out. That, that changes it, because the Z panel is used for the 3D imaging. Now, an MRI stimulates a signal from the object using magnetic fields and radio frequency pulses. An MRI reads data using magnetic gradients and places it into case space, which is a frequency domain. This basically goes into high level physics using the use of vectors. I didn't want to complicate it that much, so I didn't want to go into too much detail on how the magnetic gradients on the case space actually work. But um, it's just need to sort of know that. It's just a domain of energy that is used. So the case space is translated, translated into a spatial domain giving an image. And the use of gradients, so you have the... Whoops. So you have the slice section, which is your z-axis. This goes through the body, so you see like from the feet upwards in the 3D image. Then you have the phase encoding, which is your x, so this goes across the body. And then you have your frequency encoding, which is your y, that goes up. So it sort of gives that 3D image of what is this way, what is up, and what is that way, essentially. Now, getting that crushed, you don't need to know that about, you don't need to know about the frequencies anymore. Let's look at the uses for an MRI. There's two uses that you use. One is diagnosis, and the second one is for research. Now, diagnosis is to find unhealthy tissues in the body. So these MRIs sort of, as previously mentioned, I talked about the, the use of an MRI being better than x-ray because it's able to locate, well, not able to locate, it's able to give pictures of the brain, it's able to give pictures of muscles that you don't typically see in the x-ray. So, so one of the uses is because it can locate tumours, it can locate locate bone damage, um, it can assess conditions of tissues, and it's also good for surgery planning. So if someone wants to go into surgery, general surgery, cardiac surgery, any type of surgery, an MRI would be the first thing they would do after an x-ray, because an X the MRI will show them the specific location that is sort of like uh, whatever tissues are being damaged or anything else. Now, in terms of research, neuroscience, this is sort of coming up a lot. I love neuroscience, so it's a reason why I took the MRI today. Um, it's used for neuroscience because the first slide, it shows the brain, it can show sort of the, um, the intricate nerves that are going in, the impulses. 
Um, one thing I didn't mention because there was two points to physics is the use of case space. There's certain atoms or sort of certain like magnetic fields that you can play around with to give you a more intricate image and a more denser image. These images are mostly used in neuroscience for stuff like locating what part of the brains are active, where someone's speaking, where someone's seeing something, um, and stuff like that. Also, research it allows to, as I was saying, um, research can also determine relationships between images and disorders. So if someone was given a disorder like dyslexia or someone given a disorder like ADHD, this sort of comes into a good play because it allows the allows the diagnosis to be more accurate. Um, it also can show cancer, so cancer cells can be seen in an MRI, you can see what tissues have been effect, affected, and then you can understand how the brain works in doing tasks. This sort of learn, learns back into neuroscience, and this also goes back into stuff I mentioned earlier, like dyslexia, ADHD, um, autism, and how that alters the brain. And that's all for today. Thank you. Any questions before I sort of finish this? Um, so you said that certain people can't take MRIs, right? So what other alternative options do they have? So people that are like pregnant, um, because they can't take an MRI, I haven't really done a lot of research into it, but um, it's the same with someone that can't take an x-ray, it's just they're just given a diagnosis based on the symptoms that they have essentially. And then when they're able to, so for example a pregnant woman gives, after she gives birth, then she will be given an MRI. Um, also, people that are claustrophobic, it's quite hard for them to give, be given a diagnosis. So they'll be given other stuff, like an ECG maybe, if they have like a heart problem. Um, and the, because like, if for, for example, a heart problem in an MRI will show you the exact place where it's sort of like the tissues are hurted or the tissues have been hurt or like the, or everything like that. Um, but if they can't do that because they're claustrophobic or they're pregnant, they'll take an ECG or any other sort of methods that are available in the medical field that they're going into really. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No?